Back behind me are three different frame types and three different movement systems for FFF or FDM, fused filament fabrication or filament deposition modeling. That's, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's uh, uh, the extrusion and sort of laying down of a bead of uh, thermoplastic material. And it's the uh, low cost way to achieve 3D printing. Of course, there's lots of other ways to do additive manufacturing. So different as all those machines are, we've got a, Car a Cartesian uh, Mendel style frame, we've got a Delta, very fast printer there, and then we've got the sort of middle of the road, which is your Core XY. So it moves more quickly than that one, but uh, it also has great accuracy, which the Delta can sometimes lack. So yeah, different as they all are, they have one common problem, and it's a big problem. And that is the fact that they print in the open air. Just look at that. So if you're extruding plastic, what you want to do is um, get it to its molten state uh, and maybe maybe past its molten state uh, where it's good and warm so that it really fuses to the layers down beneath it. But then you want to freeze it. And it's just like water, right? It's just like really viscous water. It's in its molten state and it flows. And then when it cools down to air uh, room temperature, it's frozen. So uh, really, you would like to be just below frozen, just, just across that frozen line. Uh, so you're just above that frozen line to sort of lay it down and just below that frozen line. And then you keep the whole part just below that frozen line, pull the whole part uh, out of the printer and let the whole thing cool down together. And you would lose a lot of the problems that we have with these open framed printers with like, um, you know, peeling up off the bed or actual layer separation that happens as you get farther up the print. So yeah. Heated chambers, or even just chambers. Like lots of people print inside of a cardboard box. They just make a box and they put that over their printer. Not only does it keep the ADS, uh, ABS fumes out of your room where you're you know, having to coexist with your printer, but uh, it also keeps the temperature there. It keeps the little air drafts off your, off your uh, part there. So yeah, enclosures, they're absolutely the most important upgrade that you can do. So why aren't we doing them? Well, there's a good reason. Uh, no company can sell an enclosure because Stratasys still has the patent and it was supposed to expire, uh, but they pulled some shenanigans with some sort of an extension with the patent office. Like, they will have had this patent for more than 20 years, which you really aren't supposed to have a patent for more than 17 years. It's, it's kind of a gray area, but it's somewhere between 17 and 20. But to get a patent to last more than 20 years is, oh, that's fishy. Like, I don't know how they pulled that, that stuff. I, I have a patent myself. I'm not against patents. Um, the problem is that patents are mostly uh, just abused by large corporations who uh, just use them to hold a monopoly and, and, and sick their lawyers on other people. So if I build a, uh, an enclosure for my printer here in this video, I am opening myself up to litigation from Stratasys. They're not going to do that though because of the Streisand effect here on the internet and what does it gain them to come sue me, some little tiny little YouTuber who's already poor and just trying to eke out an existence here in this 3D printer community? Uh, you know, it's really not going to benefit them, but they could. So uh, they, uh, it's no joke. They have a patent for a reason. They really don't want people making uh, heated enclosures, but their patent will run up. It will run out. So when it does, this is going to be the technique. So let me show you guys everything that I've learned trying to make a 3D printer that can print polycarbonate without any issues. Let's get into it. So let's go to Google and see what everybody else uh, thinks a 3D printer enclosure should look like. So we see a bunch of uh, clear plastic cubes. That's pretty much what everybody wants. And I think this all started here with this motif that you're looking at. This is the Ikea LAC hack, which I think is this one here. Yeah, so this is, I think, maybe the original DIY from 2015. Um, so we've had these, you know, solid-sided, uh, you know, plexiglass or, or, or acrylic sheets, single wall uh, Ikea LAC hack from, from quite a few years ago, almost five years ago now. But if you image search and you go through it, um, there's tons of these things. Look at this guy selling it uh, on Etsy for, for money. And this is a, you know, extrusions, aluminum extrusions, but again, single wall and everybody does this. And I don't understand why nobody has uh, thought to make a double walled enclosure. 
See, this is the basically a cutaway drawing and picture of the glass that you find in your house. Any any modern home or skyscraper or whatever has double uh, pane glass. Sometimes there's triple panes, and it's actually the, the center pane is just a membrane, but uh, you have an outer pane and an inner pane, and the airspace in between insulates. So why is nobody doing you know something like the IKEA hack only with two walls? And uh, so that's what I'm going to try to accomplish here, but I don't want to be spending two $260 on this uh, enclosure. It really shouldn't cost that much money. So I'm going to see what I can do to, you know, make this same uh, motif or, you know, this, this, this is, this is what everybody thinks of when they think of a, an enclosure. So I'm not going to question the wisdom of the crowd too much. I'm just going to go with it, but make the, uh, the glass uh, double walled. So to that end, here is the design that I've come up with. Now um, I can click on this group here and move it and you can see there is my door and I'm not going to put that on hinges I'm just going to have it uh, you know pull out and then and then push back into place but you can see there's uh, two panes of glass actually let's uh, let's just select those so you can see double wall thickness there with an air gap in between them and for the uh, for the material that I'm going to actually use, you know, that's where the expense comes in. Cause I can make all these uprights here out of a two by four, as well as all of the, um, you know, the cross members out of two by four as well. And then these top panels, you can see those right there. I can make those out of Luon and Luon is just a really cheap and thin plywood. So very inexpensive. Uh, you could build this whole thing for, I don't know, 20 bucks so far. And really the expense is just going to come from those, those, you know, plexiglass or actual glass, uh, sides. But here on the Home Depot's website, we can find a four foot by eight foot sheet of Macrolon 0.03 inches. That's, um, basically 0.75 millimeter and it's a hundred bucks. So still pretty cheap. Um, because it's, uh, because it's thin, you'd be worried about it not being as insulated, but we've got that air gap in between the, the two walls. So it really doesn't need to be that thick. So I think this is going to do a great job, uh, for this, uh, for this design. So this is the plan. And basically what I need to do is cut out, uh, start by cutting these, um, these uprights. And you can see I've got these slots cut into them to receive the, uh, the plexiglass or the, 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 the polycarbonate sheets. So let's get to work in the real world, uh, doing a little bit of carpentry, making this enclosure. You guys know how 2020 aluminum extrusions are kind of like the paradigm. That's the thing that everybody thinks of when they when they need to make a frame for something here in the maker community. I consider two by twos to be kind of the same deal, uh, for but made out of wood and a whole lot cheaper. You can get a two by four for like three dollars, and so that means that every two by two <laughs> costs like a dollar fifty. So uh, they're very inexpensive. They're a little bit flexible, but for most things like boxes and shelves and whatnot, you can uh, easily engineer your project to to you know to work just fine with them. So. You can see that on the table saw, I cut out two slits and then I just used my chisel to actually cut the ends of the slit out. I did not want the cuts to go from end to end. So I've got this terrifying little set of circular saw blades and I got this on eBay a year or two ago. Um, I think I plan to use them in my Dremel tool, um, but they're, that's why they're so terrifying. They've got so much bite, they just jump off the material that you're trying to cut and they, they slice your hand up. So really not for a hand tool. I don't know what the intended purpose is for these things, but I came up with the perfect usage uh, just now in this project. This blade here is the largest one that came in the kit and it's one millimeter thick. The, the metal that it's made out of is exactly one millimeter, which also happens to be the thickness of the clear plastic window. So the polycarbonate sheet is one millimeter as well. So cutting the grooves for the polycarbonate sheet to sit inside of with this blade is, gives a perfect fit. Um, which is awesome. So I've currently got this all set up with this fence you can see here and it basically just ends up being like a table saw on its side. And here I am cutting the Luon, the uh, the thin plywood uh, cover for the top and the base, you know, the floor and the ceiling of the chamber. And you can see by the beard that I had in this clip that uh, I recorded this footage quite a few months ago. This project has been ongoing, uh, kind of in the background. It's, it's not been a, a major priority for me, um, but I have been working on it. And uh, actually, I've, I've had it running here for a couple of months, but I just got around to making the video for you guys uh, recently. Anyway, yeah, this is the uh, the construction technique. Um, you know, it's basically a holocore door. This is, I mean, I don't have the paper. Normally, holocore doors have this like sort of um, honeycomb shaped um, paper 
on its edge that uh, that really stiffens the center. And if I was going to do this project again in the same construction technique, I might fill the uh, the cavity there with some expanding foam, like some great stuff, something like that. Um, and here I am cutting the uh, the polycarbonate. So this is going to be all of the windows. Um, yeah, that's you know two two by two, so two uh, double paned windows everywhere. So that's that's how I uh, made those shapes. Okay, so the first sheet of polycarbonate is uh, installed into this bottom, which, which is actually the top, because this is currently upside down. So it's in, installed in the slot where it's supposed to be there at the top. And what I'm trying to do at the moment is slide it into the vertical slot here that it's supposed to go into. And I'm having a very hard time getting that to go in there. Um, so these slots, just as I planned, are a good friction fit uh, and that was to make them so that they are uh, airtight, so that I have a really well insulated box to print inside of. And um, well, the difficulty sliding that in is only the beginning because this is just the first piece. This is a double layer, so when I can grab both sides, it's challenging enough, but what happens uh, when I'm doing the, the piece back behind there and I can't even grab both sides of it. So, and then it's even worse than that because eventually I will have six uh, of these pieces in there. So three sides each with uh, two pieces and I will be trying to slide down the bottom wood piece uh, over the over onto that. So I will have six pieces with the grooves here that I'm trying to line up all in one perfect moment and it's, it's not gonna happen. So I've gotta redesign this enclosure uh, for buildability. Well, you guys, I didn't document the process, but this is what I ended up with. I basically didn't want to scrap the entire build, so instead of using a polycarbonate windows on all four of the sides, I just ended up using some sheets of Luon. Um, so I was able to kind of salvage the uh, two by two construction. And I don't recommend anybody duplicate this chamber. Uh, there are better ways to do it. For instance, you could get um, polyurethane foam. You can order it from the Home Depot or Lowe's or maybe they have it in stock. And that, that polyurethane foam has a foil backing to it. So it would be more uh, temperature resistant and uh, even flame resistant than the wood. That being said, wood is more flame resistant than people give it credit for. I don't print with this thing um, unless I'm in the room with it and I have a fire extinguisher close by. So anybody who wants to raise safety concerns, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm DIYing, I'm experimenting. This isn't a final product. There is some fire danger with this thing. So uh, yeah, don't do it like this, but this is working and it's a great proof of concept. And the key, and this is the point of the whole video, this is what I wanna get out to everyone. When you build your chamber, and you absolutely should build chambers, you would get much better results out of your higher temperature plastics in a chamber. Um, and when you build your chamber, it needs to be sealed, sealed. So don't let air come in and out of it. It needs to hold all the air inside of it. And also, uh, it needs to be insulated. So think about those, uh, the really fancy coolers. Who are they made by Yeti? And I think there's a bunch of copycats now. Uh, why are those, you know, $300 coolers so much better than your $20, you know, roto molded, uh, crappy <laughs> igloo coolers or whatever you want to whatever brand names attached to those. And the reason is just because they seal really well. They're very uh, tough and strong and stiff, and those lids have a O-ring, and they bolt down. They've got those like uh, those basically glorified rubber bands to really hold them uh, to the, the base. The lid holds to the base, and so you don't get any air leakage. So air leakage is huge. So yeah, that's what it comes down to. Insulate it and make it sure that it's sealed uh, whatever chamber design you end up with. So that's how you design the box. And for me, uh, because I kept that same sort of front door, in order to seal it, I just used some of this foam gasket material that I had in my garage from when I was sealing my, um, my truck canopy to the pickup truck bed. So that works out quite well. Um, yeah, and so it, it is working. But there's more to a heated chamber than just the box. So let's talk about the other components that you're gonna need uh, on this. You're going to need a heater of some sort. You're going to need uh, the printer, obviously, that's the whole point. And well, there's some considerations there. We'll cover it in a second. And you're going to need um, a way to control the heater with your printer. So uh, yeah, each of those things are now a pile of worms or yeah, I think that's the saying. Box of worms, whatever. That's it's the, Each of those things is an issue uh, that's going to take some of your time to figure out. Well, three years ago, when I first decided to make a heated chamber, you can see one of my very first videos I was talking about 
uh, making a, a printer that was heat resistant enough to put in a chamber. I knew I wanted to do this from when I very first started this channel. It's just been a long road to get here. And when I first thought I was gonna do this project, this is what I bought. I bought a bunch of these, well, three of these AC, I think these are AC, yeah, 220 volt AC heater cores. And the idea was just to put one of these 120 millimeter fans uh, and blow across these heater cores here and uh, use this LC25 or something like that, um, Arduino little PCB to somehow uh, get an Arduino, because uh, back then I was running Marlin. So I was gonna get an Arduino to sort of work as a, the, the chamber heater brain and somehow talk to Marlin. And I didn't quite know how I was gonna do it. And this is rather convoluted, right? This is a, quite a DIY in-depth uh, way to do it. But there's a much easier way. This is a Harbor Freight special, cheap, cheap, cheap uh, heat gun. Basically a glorified hair dryer. Uh, don't use it as a hair dryer, you'll light your skin on fire. Uh, it's got two settings. It's got hot with a high fan, and it's got kind of hot with a lower fan. And the amazing thing about this uh, unit is just how incredibly value engineered it is. It has no electronics to speak of. It's got, uh, what is it, Schottky diodes. That's it, Schottky diodes and a motor and a, and a, and a coil. There's no brain to it. There's no microchip or any of those. It's just a switch and some Schottky diodes. I burned up one of those. Uh, actually, the one that I had was about 15 years old. I'd already sort of abused it and it, it, it was of questionable life anyway. But sticking it here in the chamber and running it at high heat, so on the high setting with the chamber up around 100 degrees uh, Celsius uh, was just too much for it to handle. So. Lesson number one, if you're gonna use one of those um, those heat guns, yeah, you, you only wanna run it at about at the 50% at the power. Now, uh, here's the way that that machine works. You can see the Schottky diodes, which are basically one-way valves for electricity. And so if you think about um, the the AC coming through uh, your, you know, the power outlet here in your house, um, it goes, it flips. The, the two lines flip positive negative, you know, 50 times a second. 50 or 60, I think it's 50 here in the United States. So um, yeah, that means that um, if you were to only use the positive from one side, you would have half of the positive. So instead of always having positive coming from either one uh, connection or the other, you only have positive voltage coming in from one connection. So it's basically like a very uh, cheater's way of doing 50% uh, pulse width modulation. So with using, what is this, four, four Schottky diodes, so inexpensive, uh, you accomplish that logic. So now all you need is a switch that decides whether or not you're gonna use both phases of the AC current or just the single phase. Um, okay, so that's how it's accomplished, um, and that's why those things are so inexpensive. But with the original um, heat gun that I was using in the, um, in the chamber, I was holding it like this and over here on the handle with some wire, which I had screwed to the lid here at the top. And at 100 degrees Celsius, these components around this cheap, cheap uh, um, hot, hot air gun, those are not high temperature plastic components, and they started to warp and the wire was cutting into them and that's no good. So I had to remove all the plastic components from this heat gun while still keeping the, uh, the functionality of it. And so uh, we'll show you in a minute, but that's basically what I was able to achieve. Now, um, that thing has a fan on it to blow the air past the, the hot coils, but that fan isn't really enough to truly circulate the air uh, inside this chamber. So uh, what I've done is I've put a um, fan here at the top that blows down. So it, it catches the air from the, uh, from the heat gun there at the back corner and the air is kind of blowing over to this front corner anyway and then it blows the hot air down which kind of makes this loop of hot air and keeps the, uh, the hot air well distributed uh, in the whole chamber. To, um, to measure the temperature of the chamber, I've just got another thermistor bolted to that side of the bed or of the, of the wall of the inside of the chamber. And yeah, inside of this uh, chamber now, I have uh, my original Ender 3. This is not the pro version, this is just the normal Ender 3 with some um, ultra base as my print surface because it's glass and I just 
trusted it more in the heat, right? That, that, that extreme hot environment inside there is really, really hard on all of the components. But the Ender 3 seems to be doing pretty well with the Delrin pulleys. These are definitely getting softer in the heat, but they, they seem that the motion system seems to be doing okay. Um, I did have to strip away a lot of the other functionality. Uh, the most important thing that I had to strip away, and this is super interesting, you guys, is the BL touch sensor. I found out that BL touch sensors will no longer work at 50 degrees Celsius. So the BL touch sensor says smart on it, and that is because the BL touch sensor, nobody tells you this, <laughs> it has the same functionality as the Pinda probe on the Prusa, because a BL touch sensor is using a magnetic sensor just like the Pinda probe we uses. Only instead of measuring the, the actual bed itself, the BL touch measures a little magnet uh, attached to the probe which is touching the bed. So yeah, I'm out with the sensor. I have to go back to the original way to level the bed uh, on an Ender 3 and that is manually using the knobs underneath. But I've replaced those big plastic knobs with these little metal knobs. Um, actually, this is an old printer. It might have come with those little metal knobs to begin with. But everything that's plastic is suspect and it's likely to warp. And so you really want uh, as much metal uh, for the components that matter uh, as you can get in there. Yeah, so a better uh, printer would have been uh, this one here, which is my, what is this, the uh, Two Trees Sapphire printer. And you can see this one's really neat because all the electronics are underneath this subfloor. So this is, this is kind of like, if you were going to put this in the chamber, you would want the floor of the chamber to come to right here. Because I've got my stepper motors, which are then controlling these rods. And that's awesome. The stepper motors are below uh, the floor as well. And then the entire motion system is uh, metal um, linear motion rails. So you have bearings, metal bearings on metal rails, uh, none of this Delrin plastic running on rails. So this is actually, I think, a better um, candidate for printing inside of, a, of an enclosure than the Ender 3. But I just, I didn't want to risk my more expensive, nicer printer on this first experiment. So I used the Ender 3 and I'm getting just fine results. And part of the reason for that is the fact that I've moved my electronics underneath the printer here. And uh, from the get-go, like I said, I've been wanting to do one of these chambers uh, for since I started this channel. And uh, to that end, when I first built up my Ender 3 here, I made the, uh, the power supply and the board into a tower which was separate, like the wires were extended off to the side just so that I could accomplish this task of putting the, uh, the power, all of that underneath the printer. And you can see that in other videos. I'll link the playlist in the, um, in the description. But yeah, so this is, it's all working great. The electronics are isolated outside the box. There are some stepper motors in here that, um, that do get hot. <laughs> Ooh, they get hot. But stepper motors do okay up to, up to they're doing fine at 100, 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, they're too hot to touch. The entire frame there is really uncomfortable to touch if I have to open it up and get in there, but, um, but it all works. And there's something really interesting to tell you guys about, and that is the fact that the heated chamber is the same as a filament dryer, right? 100 degrees Celsius, that's really quite warm, or even, even printing at 50 or 75 degrees. So that filament, that polycarbonate roll uh, in the open air, if I just set that on top of my printer here, or on top of the box, and just leave it overnight, yeah, it'll, it'll it, that quickly, it absorbs the water out of the air. Uh, and it starts printing terribly. The little snap crackling and popping you get from wet filament. But as long as I keep it in the chamber while I'm printing, it's drying even further every time, you know, as I'm printing in this hot chamber. So really cool stuff. Um, if you build a heated chamber, you've also basically got a, uh, a filament dryer as well. What else, what else? Um, yeah, I'm using one of those uh, Creality dual drive um, capstan extruder mechanisms. I found that that was actually kind of important I uh, didn't have very good luck with my old school metal one, which was like, again, like a two or three year old design. Um, maybe a newer metal design would have worked and I didn't need the double gears, but it's nice to have it. Peace of mind, because you really shouldn't be breaking into uh, this box once it starts printing. It's really hands off. You don't want to, you don't want to get any drafts of cool air in there to mess up your, your prints. All right. Well, the final thing to talk about before we start sending some test prints for you guys to see is uh, how you control uh, all these components together. So I'm sure there's a way to do it with Marlin, but it's gonna be convoluted. And you guys know uh, I consider my time to be 
I don't know, a little bit valuable at least. And I fought with Marlin for too many hours of my life. I fought with crappy Chinese electronics for too many hours of my life. So I like to go with the solution that I just know will work and it just, it's easy. And it gives me all the flexibility to make the project happen the way that I want to. And that is a duet control board. So uh, duet control boards have uh, the chamber, heater chamber functionality built right into them in the, the RepRap firmware. And then of course there's the plugs on the, on the actual hardware to accept those, uh, those, those things as well. Um, the problem is um, RepRap firmware, uh, it has some thermal runaway protection uh, in case your printer catches on fire, it automatically shuts off, which is a good safeguard. But um, uh, as a normal user, I can't get into the back end uh, code. I mean, I could. <laughs> I could really. It's all open source. I could really go in there and try to fight with it and uh, make my own build of the of, of RepRap firmware. But um, I'm I'm not. I'm going to do the workaround anyway. So the the um, it's tripping a thermal runaway protection error, basically. It, it thinks that the chamber heats too slowly with just a single one of these um, you know, heat guns. I might be able to put two of these heat guns in there and it would heat up quickly enough that uh, it wouldn't trip that error. But um, with just a single one, I have to get the chamber um, up to temperature before I turn the control over to the duet board. And to that end, I've got a switch under here where I can just turn it on. And we can see I've got it set to only be able to run the um, the slow setting. That's the you know 50% on the, the pulse with the pulse with modulation hack with the with the shot key diodes. It's only 50% on. But I'll run it like this for uh, I think it gets up to 50 degrees in about five minutes, 75 degrees in like 10 minutes, and it takes a while to get it to 100 degrees. If I had foam or better insulation, it might go more quickly. But here's the interesting thing. Um, the, the, the metal of the frame of the printer is the uh, controlling factor here. The, the metal, you have to get it up to, it's like a radiator itself for heat. So you have to get the metal um, up to 100 degrees and then your chamber will, stable, will stay stable. So it's kind of easy to get the air up uh, to 100 degrees, but you'd be surprised how sort of well this thing holds heat once it's been at temperature for a certain amount of time. Yeah, so then uh, once I've done that and I'm looking at my, uh, you know, the control on the computer and I can see that it's at the temperature I want it to be at, then I can turn on the, the functionality for uh, keeping it at that, at that chamber temperature that I want it. And it will turn the, um, the heater gun, the heat gun on and off, you know, as it needs to, to maintain the, the chamber temperature that I've set. So yeah, there you go. That's my chamber project that's uh, quite functional. So let's jump on the computer. I'll show you uh, the interface for a quick second. What you're looking at here is the, uh, the interface, the web interface to the Duet control board, which is controlling the, uh, the chamber heater and, and the, uh, the Ender 3 in the chamber itself. So uh, obviously you've seen this before. If you're watching my channel, uh, you can control how hot the nozzle is, how hot the bed is. And I've built in, you know, by activating it in, in the, uh, the firmware configuration file, I've activated the chamber heater. So I've currently got it set to 82 degrees and I could drop that to 80 degrees and it would stop cycling. I, I'm hoping you can hear that. I hope it comes through this, mo this microphone. It's uh, cycling, turning itself on and off in like a very slow pulse width modulation uh, <laughs> cycle. And I've been doing this manually, but you can certainly build it into your, um, your slicer software where it keeps the chamber at a certain temperature as well. So yeah, let's jump over to the printer itself and talk about what I've just made. And you can see in there, I've got a print, uh, which is finished, uh, there on the bed and just listen to that, uh, um, the fan unit. So that's back there in the corner. We'll see it glow red here in a second. Um, anyway, so I'm ready to pull that part out of there, but I wanted to show you guys a couple of things. First of all, I had this switch in there attached to the wiring still, and it had this nice sort of um, spring actuated plunger that melted. You can see the melt right there. And so that switch failed on me. Just to give you an idea of the stuff that happens uh, in a hundred degree chamber, uh, I really need to, this is just iteration number one, proof of concept. There is a lot of work before this is ready for prime time. All right, let's take a look at that print. So I'm using these cloth um, covered rubber bands, kind of like hair ties uh, to hold the door closed. And then you can see the print in there and it's fully stuck to the bed. There's no 
delaminating or peeling of that part. And I'll show you here in a minute that, I mean, well, you can see the length on that part. Imagine trying to print that out of um, ABS and know that PETG uh, is just that much worse at warping than ABS. So you can see the reflection on the base there. That is a perfectly flat part. By the way, this is that blade holder in action. And you can see that it does a really good job um, holding a regular utility knife blade. These two peened um, rivets are just made out of some copper wiring. And then here it's held on with an M3 screw into a, um, what is that, uh, an insert. You know, it's an aluminum insert that's brass plated. When you go to eBay to buy these things, you get them really cheap because they're not completely made out of brass. They're just brass plated. But they do the job, and actually this knife uh, works pretty well too. So I've got a couple of these that float around my shop, so you know I never know where I set them down. And there's always one that I can find somewhere. So that worked. Um, but let's uh, let's talk about uh, test prints a little bit more here for a minute. I made this print here in an attempt to uh, get a failure to occur that I could then show the uh, the heated chamber uh, addressed and fixed. But uh, if you go back and you watch my older video here about printing at 310 degrees, uh, you'll see the failures that I was getting on those polycarbonate prints. And I didn't get any of those failures on this print here, which is printed in the open air, uh, meaning I took the lid off. I took this front, the front um, door off, but it's still enclosed on five of the six sides of the cube. So even just five sides enclosed uh, still gives you better results than printing in the, in the wide open air. So uh, because I couldn't get a failure to occur, I couldn't show you guys a before and after. Uh, I wasn't about to unbolt the printer out of that enclosure just to get a crappy print so that I could then show you that it was better. Because trust me, it's better. Anybody who's ever printed with uh, ABS knows the struggle. If you try to make large parts uh, on your bed, they will peel up uh, unless you, you use like a slurry, like an ABS slurry, which just really keeps them attached to the bed, but you're still getting all of those internal stresses trying to peel that up. And so you're likely to get layer separations where it can't peel up off the bed. So instead the part itself sort of cracks in the middle of the part. So uh, heated chamber. It's the way to go. It's the ticket for any of these um, higher temperature resistant plastics, polycarbonate, PEEK, ABS. Uh, if you want good results, make a heated chamber and your heated chamber needs to be sealed and insulated. And also I think that I'm onto something with the, um, the hot air gun, uh, you know, modules. It's a, it's kind of a already made fan heating element module for like $14. Why would you, try to make your own. It's, it's very effective. Now I am printing a lot of parts from my other printers on this printer just because I want that uh, the heat resistance of the polycarbonate. But um, I'm printing at 330 degrees now, which gives me really good uh, layer adhesion. And oh my God, uh, polycarbonate is the best material I've ever printed with. You can just feel the strength in the parts. Uh, it's, it is significantly stronger than everything else. It's stiffer, stronger, all of it. I ordered some, um, what is it? Carbon fiber impregnated polycarbonate. That stuff's going to be amazing. <laughs> so I've got the ability to make some seriously engineered parts now, uh, because of this chamber, but, uh, I really would like to make another version of the chamber. Um, the outside of the wall here, I think I measured it at like 45 degrees, uh, when I'm printing at like. 80 degrees. So it's about half the, the chamber temperature in there. That's what the skin of my, uh, uh, my wooden box here measures. So with an actually insulated chamber, not just these like double wall, you know, uh, Luon plywood uh, structures, the heated chamber uh, idea is a winner. However, I do now have a, a new problem um, and that manifests here on the new knife that I printed, and that is pillowing. Um, and you can look up pillowing. Most of you probably know what that, uh, that problem is on 3D prints on your top layers. Um, yeah, so part cooling is not ideal. I was printing this at 88 degrees. The chamber absolutely gets up to 100 degrees, um, but you know, even at 88 degrees, I was getting pillowing with, uh, um, with part cooling at full blast. So I need to lower the chamber temperature to a level where uh, I don't get peeling up off the bed and yet I get good uh, part cooling. So it's gonna be lower than 88 degrees. 
I don't know, maybe it's 60 degrees, maybe it's 75 degrees. Um, but, you know, I definitely am fighting with that, that peeling. This is uh, an older version of the knife that I printed up, and I printed this when the printer was an open air printer, and I had two layers of the brim material, and the brim was like, you know, a centimeter and a half wide across that whole thing with two layers, and I could not get it to stay down. It peeled up. Just so much force to, uh, wanting to peel it up. And there isn't a slurry like you can do with ABS. There isn't a slurry for polycarbonate. So um, I absolutely need the chamber to be at a certain temperature to get that to stay down. And yet I need that part cooling. So either I'm sort of jetting in outside air for the part cooling. That's an idea. But then you're uh, you know diluting the, the, the chamber and you're making it. Uh, cooler as well, whereas the sealed and insulated, you know, that's the whole point is to keep the heat inside there. So it's a it's a del delicate balancing act for sure. As I was editing this video, the best solution uh, to the problem occurred to me, and that is to just use a, a larger part cooling fan or multiple part cooling fans uh, just to really get a whole lot of that 88 degree air blowing across the part because the freezing point of polycarbonate is well above 88 degrees. So as long as I can just get a larger volume of air to strip away that heat from the uh, from the part, then I think I will no longer be having this issue. But, uh, you know, in further experiments, I'm sure I will get it to a level where it's it's perfect. But I'm going to definitely be remaking this, uh, this box at some point in the future. For now, though, it's working just fine, and I couldn't be happier with the parts that I'm getting from it. So that will do it for this video. Here's a link to another video that YouTube thinks you want to watch, and there's a link to my Patreon account. Please go over there and toss me a buck. It really helps out. See you next time. Thanks for watching.